Welcome back to the Change Interview Series. Today my guest is Lalita Donatella Ribeck and we are going to talk about her big life change uh, and what came out of that and maybe also what uh, preceded it. Lalita is an author. She is a Vedic astrologer, a life coach and a spiritual teacher. And uh, I would start with the question uh, our audience certainly is thinking about, Lalita. What does your ma name Lalita mean and how did you get that? Because as I have seen on your website, you are of Italian origin. Yes, 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 you're right. Hi, Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne. I'm very pr proud of being interviewed, very honored. Thank you. Um, I am, my, at birth, my name was Donatella, like many Italian girls. <laughs> and I was born in Italy, parents, Italian parents, educated in Italy, un Italian university, everything. But then my husband is American, so I got married uh, and moved to Chicago. And Lalita is my spiritual name that my spiritual teacher, Dr. Baskaran Pillai, gave me uh, 10 years ago. And uh, there is a saying in this um, yogic tradition that when you change a name, also your life will change in a positive way. So <laughs> I adapted that name fully. I love it. It's the name of this Supreme Mother um, Goddess the Supreme Goddess, uh, Lalita Tripura Sundari. <laughs> That's why it's, it's not Italian. <laughs> and uh, Lalita, I've seen that uh, before you became um, a Vedic astrologer and a life coach and a spiritual teacher, you have uh, been a journalist and you have also worked in public relations and then in 2003 so that's 20 years now you made a big change uh, to your career path would you just tell us about uh, this um, decision and how it came about yes yes sometimes we need a little push to make the wanted change and and i'm no exception I was doing very well in PR. I was vice president. I was getting great, cool accounts, etc. Working with fabulous people, and I had good reputation in the media. They called me for quotes or for stories. So I was very lucky. And, and then suddenly, nothing. <laughs> I failed every account, like two accounts in a row. And I thought, wait, what's going on? So I was taken aback. I was so used to having it so easy. So I started to get very bored, but I needed to fail, the, you know, what I was trying. I was trying to get coverage for two clients. One was an institute of psychoanalysis and another was a, a billionaire uh, poetess who wanted to start, you know, writing po poetry and be yeah. And I, nothing, nobody wanted to cover these two stories. And I was like, what? Why? <laughs> so I was very depressed and also very bored. So I started to look out of the window, etc. So one day I read in the New York Times an article that said, I used to work in PR and I was very stressed. So I took up yoga and then I liked it so much. I became a yoga teacher and I quit PR. I was like, I want that. I was 10 years before I had started to take yoga and I was I was pretty good at it. And also I studied the philosophy. I studied the you know yoga sutras and I was a proper yogini, but I still was in PR. Right. Um, and that gave me the idea. I said, OK, I'll quit PR and I'll become a yoga teacher. I just want that. I want to wear yoga pants. No more, you know, dressing up and no more going anywhere. I just want to do that. And I did. I didn't get a chance until 2003, which was a year later. And I regret waiting a year because it was really boring. And I, I felt also guilty, you know, because I wasn't doing a good job suddenly. And then um, and it was really beautiful. Uh, so I enrolled in this course. It was a proper course. Uh, we start, like we sat for 12 hours. And, yeah, oh, close to 10 hours a day, cross legs, legged. And then we studied all this beautiful uh, philosophy and I became a Reiki master. And then I, 
I studied the Bhagavad Gita and I was very good at certain poses. I looked really picture perfect at that time. <laughs> I was lucky that I was able to master some, some positions, etc. And then that was how I decided to go, you know, full immersion. It just didn't get things. I just wanted to help people who didn't like their jobs or were miserable in their, you know, professional life and they wanted to do something uh, better for themselves, to get healthier and happier. See, I didn't feel that yoga and meditation were just to calm the mind. I felt, no, they're transformational. They bring back your happiness. I was bubbling with energy and joy at that time, and I wanted everyone to have a chance to have a chance to get that. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's interesting. I uh, I think uh, a lot of people who are in the um, coaching industry and are doing um, coaching and uh, teaching and uh, who are also um, have gone down the spiritual path, many of them have been in other professions before or in other businesses in other life paths and then at some point made a change. I mean, uh, like myself, and that's why I started this interview series, actually, which is called Change. Because um, I thought it's interesting to um, tell the stories of people who have made or have faced. Yes. Some have made and some have faced major life changes and to see how they have navigated that and how they have come um, uh, where they are now. Because I think that can give inspiration and um, also support to people who are in the same situation, who either are not happy where they are and want to change something or who have uh, some change coming up that they haven't chosen themselves but have to deal with. Yes. Or in the case, they want to stay exactly where they are. They just want to find their joy again and their physical energy, their happiness and not feel lethargic and getting some coffee and going to work. Why? We have all these available and it's amazing how it can help. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, an important point that for some people, uh, if they are not happy where they are, it means they have to make a major change and have to make a leap, so to speak. For some yes. people, it's just that some details don't work, you know, and they just have to make some little adjustments and changes to make that uh, work for them, <laughs> what they are in at the moment. Yeah, so to express better just to be joyful that's a big part the 200 percent life that we'll talk about and that's, <laughs> that's obviously the... that's obviously something uh, you are offering and uh, i'm offering to and other coaches are offering to people to uh, um, make either make a bigger change or make smaller changes uh, to just yeah, be happier so where they are <laughs> Uh, right, you're right. It doesn't need to be the full transformation. Yeah. It's a menu. You take what works for you, right? Exactly. Um, some people may be intimidated. Oh, I don't want a transformation. I'm happy. I have, but you know, if you want little extra motivation and even some success, because we all have some moments when we lose heart and we're insecure, and a lot of women now are working um, and. Uh, I grew up that way. My mother used to work, right? She was a journalist. I think I told you that. Um, but I feel that now that all, almost all women are working, there's this new thing that I never heard about. It's called the imposter syndrome. syndrome. So every women are so used to give so much um, to the family, to the community, friends, etc. And then once they show up as professionals or as anything it can be public figures or it can be um, a different kind of career or job they feel insecure it's like oh if they find out i'm not that great what happens to me and i've experienced that too in the beginning you know like oh my god look at those this perfection these per perfect people or women and we compare and it's a terrible thing to do and i don't do that anymore now I teach others don't do that yourself. It's not worth it. <laughs> yes, it's a uh, yeah. That's that that's a that's a really important thing. The imposter syndrome. Uh, it's uh, actually I come from academia, and in academia that's really oh, rampant. I mean, yeah. academia breeds the imposter syndrome yeah, yeah. in men and women. 
Uh, but that, it's interesting that you say it's uh, it's often in women that uh, when they come from a background of caring for a family and they start in business that the, they they are struggling with that especially and potentially more than men. Um, actually, yes, actually, I hear a lot of women. I've never heard men feel that way. Maybe we are brought up differently. I believe that men may have, you know. They may have different issues, so, yeah. but not that one, and that, that doesn't make it any easier. But women typically have that, yes. Yeah. Um, but to, to come back to the situation where you have a major life change, for people who want to make that or who um, just f are, are facing something, we, we, I think we are uh, going to get there too uh, with your story uh, in a moment. I would like to dive a little bit deeper in your big life change uh, in 2003 first and to um, uh, just to dig a bit deeper and uh, ask you how you managed to do that uh, essentially because you were in uh, in PR you had I think you had a, a, a position of responsibility probably a good income I would uh, assume and then you uh, you had already been uh, in uh, sp the sp spiritual realm and yoga and all that, and you knew about that, so you had the skills, obviously, and the knowledge. But uh, when you have done something completely different, and then you want to change and actually become a yoga teacher or a meditation teacher and uh, um, and, uh, and start over with that... Uh, I would uh, assume there are a couple of things to take into ca consideration, like uh, how um, how did you make a living then? Yeah, it, that part was not the best. <laughs> uh, the switch, right? Financially, definitely didn't make any sense in the beginning. But I believe, if you don't mind me saying, we are we have kind of a destiny, but we have a lot of free will. And there was a time when I was doubting myself. Also, there were some financial problems. My husband and I were both working. He was a lawyer and he uh, here I am. I was in PR and still like he, my husband was married before. So there were kind of two families to take care of, you know, um, and uh, I felt so worried about this that I almost had no choice. Then one day after like a, some kind of dark night of the soul, what would I do? What should I move or should we move to Italy or should we do other things? Finally, we decided not we'll stay. But the courage of change came actually for a spiritual reason that I never talk about. But I did talk about it in my books. And... Uh, I, I had a vision. I was a night. It was a night, and I was very worried. I'm not. Like, what am I doing? Uh, where am I going? You know, there was a house issue, etc. And then finally, I had this vision of a monk full of love and light. There was so much light, and, and he said, "All your problems will be solved." And less than a, four four weeks later, like so, about a month, it was all solved in mysterious ways. We simply moved to another state for unforeseen circumstances, and it was divine. Like I found this campus of the Ursuline nuns where that were offering um, courses in yoga and Reiki mastery, and even later an initiation in Kriya yoga. It was so divine. It was just like a different dimension altogether. So I do have that st strong uh, belief that it happened thanks to divine design because I was so, everything was so easy. I almost had no choice. In fact, when we first moved to Ohio, I was looking for a PR job and uh, I couldn't find it. And it's despite having a great background, you know, from a big city, Chicago and all these media, they're, you know, more visible than this place in Ohio. And still I couldn't find a job. And then after two weeks, I was kind of frustrated. My husband said, well, why? Why are you even trying? Didn't you want to become a yoga teacher? And I said, yes. And so he encouraged me. So, yes, it was the divine. Also, my husband was divine. <laughs> he pushed me. He gave me the final push. And I said, okay, let me do that. And okay. then 
-hmm. It was perfect. Yeah, it was amazing. So um, that means just to summarize, um, uh, that means you you saw this um, story of someone else who changed from PR to yes, yoga teaching, yeah. and uh, the, and you intuitively said, yeah, and that's what I want. And then yes. uh, over the course of a year, you uh, had um, I had opportunity. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, you, you first try to figure it out, and then there was an the opportunities opened up, and you had this yes. you had this vision, and then uh, this vision that everything will be okay, and then opportunities and so, opened up, and the but you still you still try to go still back. Still doubted myself because do you know how we are stuck? We, I was so stuck. Yeah. That's what I tell my clients. So we need someone else. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we're so stuck, we don't see another way. So you need the divine intervention. If, if that's not there, at the very least, you have to believe in yourself that it is possible. And, and maybe somebody else will help you, right? So there it's a, I believe that if you want something strongly enough, it happens. So it does happen if you, Nothing is impossible. That's been my experience in the last 20 years. Everything is possible and we're helped. We have in infinite help. All we have to do is forget the imposter syndrome. And then, you know, because I, I used to compare myself to the girls in the magazines and their poses were like, maybe they were doing that since they were five and I wasn't. So like, yeah, I took some dance, so I was quite flexible. And I was practicing for 10 years before I enrolled in the school. And so it was easy physically and also philosophically, I was inclined to it, definitely. But you can do anything. Just because you're a doctor, I'm, I'm telling someone who's a doctor, a medical doctor, it doesn't mean you cannot do something else. Start your business and do totally different thing. It is possible. And I think we should, because we shouldn't be miserable. And he, that's why he supported me. He said, nobody should be doing something they don't like. But my uh, experience with my clients and even friends, when they didn't make that, they usually, the people who find me, they're usually ready and they're not, they're not particularly stuck, but they definitely have something missing that they want. And I don't decide, <laughs> they do. Right? Yeah, they decide what they want to do. And, yeah, of and I'm to help right so i can i can help them with various tools collected over 20 plus years even longer than that yeah yeah because it's right this year it's 20 years this, that you have been uh professionally uh, in this it was 20 exactly mm -hmm. so maybe that's a point we should we should make in this interview for people who um listen to this and uh, and watch this uh, from um, outside of the coaching sphere who want to get a bit of a picture also that coaching doesn't mean to push someone into a direction no, but never. it means to to help them find their support, own way support, help with tools that you have available according to their choices so in fact the first few uh, coaching sessions are really to understand the uh, goals of my clients so it's all about them. It's not about me. I'm not invasive. <laughs> I don't tell them, this is your path. <laughs> I don't do that with anyone, not even with my children. To the point, one of my sons once said, Mom, you should have pushed me. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it usually doesn't work. When parents start to push, then the children it, go the other way. <laughs> it would have backfired anyway. So <laughs> you should have pushed me. That was a new one. So you started out as a yoga and meditation teacher, right? And um, just as a side note, because you mentioned the, the positions uh, you could see in the magazines, um, that's an, uh, a thing I, I think people who uh, haven't gone uh, down that path uh, have a false conception of. Because, um, for example, I um, have uh, gone to yoga classes too for a couple of years and Uh, my yoga teacher is a very down-to-earth per person who has also been in fitness before and uh, she obviously can do a lot more than I can, but she is uh, not uh, uh, someone who can, you know, uh, do a, a, a very strange magical things with her body and she can still be a good yoga teacher.
but that's not yoga. I used to put my leg around my neck. Um, I used to do the wheel, like uh, all these advanced poses, which come just by practice. I was naturally flexible, also I had practiced dance, you know, um, so ballet and, and jazz and all. But that's not the yoga. What is yoga? It's a union uniting your human mind with the cosmic mind, with the universal mind, which gives you power. So if we lose our limitations and, and there's no limit and we can do anything. And that doesn't mean, you know, that necessarily you have yogic powers, but definitely they can be acquired and it gives you strength and sense of confidence. Um, the first time I talked in front of a large crowd of 200 people, I was a co-chair of cultural affair, uh, cultural events. And only women, about 500 women. I panicked so much that I forgot to say uh, thank the president, to thank the, my co-chair. I just, just talked and said something. I was paralyzed and now I talk publicly all the time. I'm very comfortable. Um, it's just like we just you just have to show up and suit up, show up always. That's an ad advice I give. It, I gave to my children, I gave give to also to my clients. Because as you do, you learn and it's not difficult. It's just you're there. That's it. It happens on its own. And we're always guided. I believe we are divinely guided. And if you don't believe in the divine, we are universally guided by the universe. We live in a benevolent universe that wants the very best for us and also that wants us to be evolved and successful. And, and we shouldn't believe that life is tough, right? Because it can be, definitely. And we have had my share, you know, toughness. But definitely good things happen and miracles happen. That's my message. I think uh, we should go a bit deeper at that point because I think there are a lot of people out there who have problems with accepting, you know, a notion of a, of a loving, benevolent universe that uh, mm -hmm. wants our best so of, of, of living uh, essentially in a benevolent world, which actually is a really nice thought to have and to cultivate. But I think many people will have problems with that because they are looking at all the horrible things that are happening yeah. and maybe are, have happened in their own lives. And so I think it's, uh, if you are comfortable with talking about it, uh, it would be great to, to share... Um, your own experience that uh, you are not talking from, you know, a position of, yeah, well, my life uh, went smoothly and nicely. And so yeah, I can right. I can believe that. I was not that lucky. <laughs> you had a really tough, uh, uh, actually brutal experience yourself in, in, uh, in your childhood. I did. I did have some trauma like everyone else, but I remember I was very spiritual and I used to talk to angels, to God, to the divine all the time. In a, you know, Mother Mary, Jesus, because I was brought up Catholic. So that was the divine I knew. And to me, it was like to, they were more real than my siblings. Uh, I saw them and I talked to them and I was comfortable with that, right? Uh, but I was also very studious, very, I uh, read a lot, etc. So I was also intellectual, it was a combination of both. And then my sister, little sister, died in an accident and I lost my faith like overnight. I didn't want to, I didn't care about the divine. I didn't care. My parents were not spiritual and we didn't go to church. So it was easy for me to just throw it out of the window. I didn't believe and I did. I was also a little resentful because from the gospels, like which I believed totally because intuitively I knew it was all true. And intuitively I know that we can do miracles. Um, I thought, okay, so if that miracle didn't come, that means it's not true. It's all a lie. And I left it behind. What does God have to do with this event in my life now, right? And now in retrospect, but as a child, as a 12-year-old, I just let it go. And I didn't care. And, and then I lived a normal life. You know, I went to university and then I started traveling. And then, so then, you know, marriage and children, etc. So we forget that we're not alone. We forget we have a lot of power. We forget that we are creating our life. We're the universe. Last year, we had three Nobel Prize winners in quantum physics who proved beyond any doubt 
the, the universe doesn't exist. So what are we doing here? Every day we choose our lives. So we are choosing, of course, we have some people who are impossible and we say, did I choose that abuser? Did I choose a mother who, you know, who neglected me or whatever, right? Anything. Maybe before birth. I have that belief that before birth, we choose some very tough experiences because they make us stronger or we needed to learn a lesson. And I know that's far-fetched for most people, but we need to believe that we have control on our lives, that we are creating, and that's where the book comes, you know, comes perfectly. We are co-creating every second with the divine. If you don't believe the divine also, that's okay. You are creating with the universe. You're still creating yourself every second. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's my that's my moment to uh, jump in and say yes, because we <laughs> have um, the book. We have, uh, just to insert that, we have connected uh, over a book collab collaboration. Yes, the collaboration. It was a very synchronistic divine collaboration. Yes. Cat the book is called yeah. Evolving on Purpose, Co-Creating with the Divine. And yes. you are uh, one of the authors of the book and I am one of the authors of the book. And so we have connected over that. And it is published by Katie Carey's Soulful Valley Publishing House on the 30th of August. Okay. Uh, at, I think it's 9 a.m. Uh, UK time. Uh, so in the United Kingdom, and that's 10 a.m. Uh, Berlin time in Germany, so in this part of exactly. Europe. And uh, I don't know what time it is in uh, in the U.S., but if oh, any... I haven't looked, but I'm yeah. excited. <laughs> but, but if anyone uh, is interested in reading this book and our stories in the book... Um, is, it comes out on, the, uh, on, on August the 30th, and it has a really... Uh, affordable, wonder, wonderful launch price, and everyone who wants to grab uh, uh, a Kindle ebook should go in right on the 30th. I believe it would be changing. Yes, yes. Everyone should read it probably because, I mean, how many are we? 22, 23 people. And we've all had amazing life changes through the, our spiritual experiences. They are international best-selling authors, uh, amazing uh, life coaches and spiritual teachers. And I believe that now the spiritual solution, the time for the spiritual solution has come because we can figure out all these crises that we're having climatically. Uh, so the climate change and the financial picture, it's so shady more than ever. I mean, we have, God knows we have a, war in Europe, so we don't need to repeat what what is not going right. What is going right, though, is that everybody is awakening to something higher and, and realizing their their presence in in a in a universe that is benevolent and that they can, they have control on their lives, at least to a certain extent. And we any time we can make that switch, that we can create something wonderful. And that's something I wanted to ask you about. Um, so you had this you had this horrible experience at age 12 when your sister died in an accident, mm -hmm. which is really uh, deep and tough uh, for a 12-year-old uh, to, to, uh, to experience that. And uh, how did you then, after you had this, uh, this uh, time where you uh, completely disconnected from all the uh, spiritual and religious things, uh, how did you get back to this conviction that uh, oh, you can make an impact on your own life? That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I love that question because I was very blessed that I didn't, you know, go into despair, drugs or other things that may happen to teenagers. Um, but it didn't happen to me. I was very blessed and protected, I guess. <laughs> Um, no drugs, no crazy stuff, no this crazy promiscuity some girls end up in or boys just to cope. I didn't have that, fortunately. I was very blessed, but I was sad. I was kind of numb. Um, even when I studied philosophy, I was always like finding the problem. Okay, but they didn't tell me if God exists. They called it the problem of metaphysics. What problem? I knew God existed. I was mad at him. 
kind of lost the devotion, but I knew with beyond any doubt that God existed because I had had my experiences, right? So I was very mad at God because I didn't get the miracle I wanted, but I lost my faith in the sense of the devotion. But so this something stayed with me. Uh, my parents kind of had that, but not really. Um, so it just wasn't born, maybe, but it can be found through what? Staying open, right? Instead of becoming a skeptic, that's also a belief system. But I don't want to criticize anyone, but the skepticism, we have taken it to a level where, where everything, it doesn't, nothing makes sense anymore. Okay, so we can choose our belief system too. Um, I believed in God, but I didn't want to deal with it. And one day I got this book. It was a, a book um, a nun gave me. Um, it wasn't some, some, I think it was divine intervention because I read this book by Tagore, a great poet, an Indian poet. It wasn't particularly spiritual in those poets, but it was, there was something else. It was so beautiful. And I thought, this is truth. I can feel it. Nobody has to tell me that is what's missing, the happiness, the joy, the love for nature, the divine and something else, love, true love. And and that's what gave me an idea. I thought uh, this is in India, but not in the West. Um, I found the literature was always like I was finding these people. Why are we studying them? They're all corrupt. They all have terrible vices. Why are we doing that? You know, they all drink, they drink so much. Okay, I was a little critical. I was a teenager. What can you do? <laughs> I wasn't very compassionate. I was compassionate, but not, you know, for, for what we were studying. I couldn't stand it. I was so depressed. And then I found it in the Indian uh, culture, in poetry first and authors. And then I found it in their way of, you know, connecting with um, your source. Let's call it your source. And, and that was, you know, like, I started to look into it. And then I, in India, I had this Vedic astrology consultation that was mind blowing. This guy knew everything about me, but not in a casual psychological way that fits everyone. He said to me, you had a very traumatic childhood. You lost somebody very dear to you. And it was, it, it was a, a, a young child. And I said, yes. <laughs> and then he said, wait. He said, you also write stories, but you're not telling anyone. You you write uh, short stories. And I said, yes. So this is not something that applies to everyone, right? Um, so it, it was very specific and made some predictions and it, everything came true. And I thought, wow, I want that. I want to study that. How do you get that? How do you get to know people's lives and help them? And... Of course, I didn't tell anybody. I was so, you know, like we're shy in the West about spiritual things. And so I put them in a drawer. I never told anybody, but it all happened. I met my husband and I went to live in Chicago where there was a, it was all the description of the astrologer. Everything came true. And then finally I wanted to become a Vedic astrologer. And I studied yoga and then eventually numer Vedic numerology and, and Vedic astrology. And so I feel that they're amazing tools. In India, that's considered a science, uh, not because they are chauvinistic, because it was born there, but because they, the Supreme Court looked into it and compared and said it's just as valid and accurate as computer science. So now people get doctor doctorates in uh, Vedic sciences and astrology, etc. It's uh, really something that we have 30,000, no, how many data? I don't remember the number, but we have 3,000 years worth of case studies. I mean, that's science, right? Uh, and you can tell somebody with the sun here will have these issues or will have this success, etc. That's just an example. It's one of my main tools to help people. Mm -hmm. So that was something that developed after you started out as a yoga teacher or, or before already? Vedic astrology was always in the back of my mind. So I, on my own, I studied some uh, Western astrology and it didn't work. I'm sorry. <laughs> I looked deeper and it didn't work. I invented my numerology system. 
uh, at 20, when I was 20, because I did want to predict, and it worked, but it was my own. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. I guess I had some intuition, we all do. And then Vedic astrology was mind blowing. Yes, I could tell. I remember my first few clients that, that which encouraged me. I would say in 1994, looks like you had a knee problem. Did you have an injury in your knee? And, and they would say, Oh yes, I fell from the bike. I had surgery like exactly that year. Like it was just so clear to me. There's something we don't understand that is beyond our comprehension and. Uh, and it's not a belief system. You have to try, right? Like everything. I hate when when somebody says, "I don't, we don't believe in astrology. It's all be bogus." I don't like that. It's not scientific to do that. You have to go and check it out, right? That's my experience. Yeah, that's 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 an interesting point you are making. Um, I uh, myself, I've uh, approached all this from the um, near-death experiences. Because for me, death was also a, a, a big subject from from early on in my teens. Um, uh, I was very aware of, of death and the end of life. And I was really un unhappy with the mater materialistic uh, interpretation, you know, of, of the world. Yeah. Because that didn't really address my needs. Because that, that says uh, everything is created, everything we are is created by our brains. And when the brain dies... Uh, everything evaporates you know right. and that was not, nothing i could really uh, live with uh, uh, happily so that was yes. a problem for me i then uh, started to read up in uh, at i think 1918 or 19 uh, i started to read up on near death experiences and i love the topic i watch videos on that all the time and, I just my and, mother had one yeah oh yeah Ah, that's that, that that's fascinating stuff and and I have come uh, through near death experiences reading up on that and uh, looking into that and you know uh, with all the objections th uh, that come up uh, uh, the brain the brain is dead and yet we have every sense every and my mother had this amazing experience as she told me and she was very intuitive also um, she basically had an accident and she went into the light and uh, she was she ignored the body she felt who cares <laughs> she went into the light and she didn't want to come back and she talked to god or her form of god or version of god i would say because there are so many versions of god but it's definitely a very powerful magnetic loving force right a source of some kind so the supreme creator and then she didn't want to come back. <laughs> she said, no, no, I'm not going back. But they said, well, it's not your time. Right? Yeah, that's, that's quite typical. It's quite typical that they can't, when they are out of the body, they can't really relate to this body anymore and they don't want to come back. It's just a dress, that's, like a dress. Yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, and and I, um, yeah, I looked into that. and uh, I, But there are a lot of objections and, you know, scientists trying to explain it away and things like that. And I looked at all of these things and uh, from there I got to other places also and I found um, essentially I found that uh, there is as little uh, evidence for the brain producing everything as there's evidence uh, you know hard scientific, scientific no, evidence true. for the, for the contrary so we can essentially we can choose what's better for us to believe. Do we want to believe one thing that is not proven or do we want to believe the other thing that is not proven? <laughs> so, uh, you know. And uh, they're all proven, actually. If, uh, Suzanne, we, if you We are, we are moving doctor, towards, yeah, we are moving. Uh, we are moving towards, like, beyond any doubt. Like Dr. Eben Alexander, he was a Harvard neurosurgeon and professor. And he, he, you know his experience, right? Uh, proof of God or something like that to his book and uh, he said I also watched some of the interviews my te my spiritual teacher also interviewed him and I did a program with him and he said his brain wasn't supposed to function the neocortex was neocortex was shut down it, it could, there was this infection that nothing worked it was brain dead and yet he was so alive and the colors, the, the experience, so much love and then emptiness and everything that the yogis described. And there are more, yeah, 
that's 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 uh, that's one really important point. I, I mean, there's a book of uh, Pim van Lommel. He makes a couple of points of this nature too. He's a, uh, um, um, a, a cardiologist in the Netherlands. He, his book is from uh, 2011. And I think in the past couple of years, we are moving ever more uh, in the direction of uh, yeah. getting this version, you know, of reality, reality or interpretation of reality ever more proven uh, but the thing is that yeah. uh, uh, the problem that uh, that we have with this is that this mater materialistic worldview is you know taken for granted okay. Okay. and there, and when you do that then then you can't move anywhere else and that's what what is actually missing in the system because it's really hard in the system to uh, establish any proper studies uh, that could prove something else because uh, they, they just design the studies in a way that it can't prove anything else than what they assume right from the start. One day will change. I believe a lot of scientists are looking into things now and they realize, okay, we were wrong. And uh, But the pride or the system itself doesn't allow them to come out and say it. And because it's either academia or companies connected with it and scientists are not that free to say what they think anymore like people have near death experience and they don't say anything they're afraid to go to a psychiatric hospital um it happened like there was i was watching someone on a great show, show on youtube and i love it that next level soul i believe it's called this podcast and a man had a near death experience he communicated with the higher beings. They told him everything that was going to happen to him and to the earth plane in the next few years. Everything was correct, the coronavirus, etc. And uh, when he came out, he was hit by a car. No, there was not even a sign. The car was high speed. He was standing in the road because he saw this light. And they told him, do you, do you trust us? And and he said, well, I don't know, but do you trust us? And, and he said, yes, you look like the divine beings. And then finally he was hit at full speed, not even a scratch. He got up, he wanted to leave. They didn't let him. They took him to the hospital. And finally the, the psycho uh, psychiatrist said, well, just to be sure, I'm sending you to a hospital, psychiatric hospital for 10 days. He didn't believe him. And I said, but I don't even have a scratch. That should be evidence. And he said, I don't believe you. <laughs> and then finally, it had to be, inter you know, that's terrible. You don't even have free to what you believe and think anymore. But so. but that's it's really a, it's really a valid point that uh, actually research research is about you know being open and and checking everything and being okay. being also being curious and being interested and uh, i think a lot of scientists are like that and academics are like that but because the system is a system uh, it's it, a myopic narrow system yeah. that they don't have the freedom even to look into things but it's and, and it's a system that it's, will, yeah, it's will a nature of it's day. it's a nature of but a system scientific model is observation a repetition there's nothing else observe it try it at least you know like at least look into the evidence yeah i mean i have actually i have a book here f from uh, by a german uh, i think he's a biologist and he he says exactly that i mean he says he, we have case studies here it's not just near-death experiences there are a lot of other things and reincarnation and is a big in the yogic path reincarnation is paramount because why we cannot learn in one life and there's so much disparity in the social injustice how do you explain that right yeah. so we cannot just uh, throw it out of the window we need to start becoming more open and looking into the details for example there are books there are so many studies on children and what they say between age like two and four uh, in that time span, right, in that lifespan, they have these memories of past lives and they remember names, events, etc. all verified, thousands of them, maybe hundreds of thousands in India, lots of studies, medical studies, scientific studies uh, here. People have looked into this, but how can we just dismiss it? Yeah, that's that's exactly the thing. If you, uh, what I found really convincing was, you know, the mass of phenomena that can't 
be explained away if you don't uh, assume that all those hundreds and thousands of people are lying or having uh, delusions, you know, or uh, so, and that's, that's not saying today, just say what they remember. We have, we have all sorts of phenomena. It's, we have the near death experiences. Yeah. We have uh, experiences at the deathbed of someone, which oh, also yes, is yes. made by people who, whose, uh, whose health and body and brain and everything was not affected by anything. And we have um, we have uh, those uh, reincarnation uh, reports. We have people who can see and uh, per actually perceive things that are uh, uh, dimensions. I did as a child, right? And I've had so many experiences, and I know that we all can have that. And that's part of what the yogis teach us. No, we are not flesh and blood. There's so much more. You said that you had. Uh, um you you lost you lost uh trust in that that it makes sense to uh to do any sort of devotion on you yes. don't have any control and there are no mir miracles coming for you when your sister died but you still had this conviction that uh there is a divine force or god is there and i was um, mildly, i would say mildly i just became the typical teenager I was just into studying or spending time with friends yeah but uh, but this you know this underlying uh, conviction or, or, or uh, that that you still had does it have to do with uh, what you mentioned that as a child you could actually see uh, a dimension yes, that experiences yes but also I, I, my intuition wasn't something that I doubted uh, I had my life was just evidence every day that what came to me intuitively was correct and what came to me rationally that I had to think about it and then maybe talk myself out of it wasn't actually accurate. When you have 100% evidence, my mother was very intuitive too. She didn't like the idea. She rejected it because she had you know, some scary experiences and didn't want that. I always felt it was a divine gift. And that's what Einstein said. Intuition is a divine gift. And uh, also he was into merging science with religion. And to me, that's another amazing thing, right? Because but we shouldn't totally separate it. You can only separate it if you think you're a monkey. But I don't feel I'm a monkey. I feel, you know, there's more to me than just the flesh and blood. So... It's really the experience sometimes and also staying open all the time because I love science. I love when science confirms all the things I knew intuitively and all the things the yogis have said. But we're not there yet to prove everything. They, they can fly. They can materialize objects. So they can be seen in two different yeah. places. But quantum physics is explaining all that. And I think you have a... Uh, is is in is a, as, uh, anything about that in your book? You have a book that says something like yes, what was the title? Yes, yes. In, I spoke about these experiences um, of the yogis. There are eight main yogic powers, and and everybody has at least one. And uh, maybe you're not looking into it. <laughs> But, um, of course, cultivation of this inner life is very important because if you always live the way we do, right, fast, outwardly, going all the time on social media, comparing, mm -hmm. doubting yourself or doing all these things, it's very hard to get in touch with your true self. Mm -hmm. And they made the true self a bad thing. It's like, oh, somebody pretends to be this person, now their true self is emerging where is, is that negative connotation coming from? This is superimposed from the outside yeah. because the true self means you're powerful beyond belief, you know, beyond your wildest dreams. And you actually, um, you can come back if you want to, to learn more, but you're already pure light, you're full of love. And the Bible talked about reincarnation in the Old Testament. So it's not like, okay, it was not in the religions. And it was there, even in um, Christianity. And just because it was removed, it doesn't mean it never existed, right? If you look deeper, you find all the evidence that even Jesus wanted us to be rich. He, his words in Aramaic were being badly translated because the original meaning of those words were it was blessing people to be rich. 
He I mean, said, my father will give you to the end of the earth. If you ask, right, it will make you very rich. And rich doesn't mean blessed, as they translated it. Aramaic word meant wealthy. <laughs> okay. Ah, so, <laughs> there is a lot going on that we need to look a little deeper. So uh, good scientists are curious, they are intelligent, and they look into things. And that's, those are my favorite sciences. <laughs> Everybody else, I'm sorry, we disagree. Let's agree to disagree. That's it. Respect <laughs> each other. But, okay, do your thing and I'll do mine. That's it. That's a fascinating topic. I mean, we can't go into every uh, bit of that uh, to, uh, tonight because that's just that's yeah. just too much. Running out of time, I guess. But uh, uh, because there's so much to uh, to talk about. But uh, when I see people um, who are, you know, they say I can see dead people. I can see uh, I can see, auras. Aura. I can I see the all that. And I intuit intuitively, I can see the. Um, I cannot say I see the colors or the energy, but I do feel, okay, this food is good, that food is not good. I intuitively know and I trust. My mother came back with super normal powers when she had her near-death experience. Yeah, sometimes. Because sometimes. seeing the light gives you a lot of intelligence. And she became, she was always incredibly bright, but she became kind of like a genius. She could do anything, like... Uh, writing articles and you know like and 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 making dinner for 30 people that she could embroider like she was amazing one day she was doing something electrical she i thought how can you do all these things she was such a renaissance woman so i believe that actually once we see the light yeah. that we have the spiritual experiences we are better we become better and full, full humans light beings yes full It's, it's rather fascinating, I think. But uh, the, there's an, an interesting point you have made uh, a couple of minutes before, uh, which was about um, what you um, what you think uh, is important now in uh, this current situation that we can't really solve all the the issues that have come up now on the on the mere rational uh, level because there's so much. Uh, Uh, global uh, intertwined um, uh, yeah. uh, issues at the moment. I think you said we should just trust that we have everything that we need um, in within, and uh, that's why I do the 200% life coaching. The idea was not mine. I, it was my spiritual teacher who invented that phrase. Everybody should have a 200% life. Uh, which means 100% material satisfaction. So yes, get married, have a wonderful life, or just to be free and travel, enjoy, make money. There's nothing wrong with that. You should enjoy it fully because the earth plane is a very beautiful place. You should be able to enjoy it. At the same time, be 100% spiritually fulfilled. Nobody should be numb. That I couldn't feel anything when I was a child, when I was a teenager, because of that trauma that was not healed. And then only through the spiritual means did I get a full life. That I, you know that, I, and now I want to help other people because there's so much more to life than what we think. That's why we should never get depressed because there are solutions. Spiritual solutions are everywhere and it's easier to find a spiritual solution than a political solution there's no red tape <laughs> right it happens fast so you, there are lots of uh there are, we have a lot of resources so that's what i wanted to say do you have a specific tip for our audience um how they can get uh, more in touch with their um their inner life their higher being yeah. Absolutely. I created some quick methods and methodologies so nobody should feel lost. Like I know what works. Like when you're in a panic, oh my God, that, that is happening. My goodness, look, this is also happening. Oh, what do I do now with that person or with this situation? Yes, we should stop, go within. Um, one of my four, my, my teachers, Deepak Chopra, used to say, just stop yourself feel the body, observe the body. And I've gone a little further, a little farther than that. 
Uh, so yes, be aware of your body and how you're breathing. That's always awesome. And from a medical doctor, that, that's awesome <laughs> advice. But also there's something you go within, put your attention here on the middle of the forehead and the nostrils. And all of a sudden you're in a different state. And uh, if you can pray, that's even better. So if you put your attention on the nostrils and the third eye, uh, the pineal gland, I don't care if it's calcified because the true pineal gland in this is in the subtle body, but even in the physical body, but just pay attention to that area and you'll be in a different state. You'll get new ideas. Um, also, you get um, like an intuition or someone will come and help you or at the very least you will not panic. You will not think, oh, I'm finished. OK, everybody has some bad experiences and just going within. I'll give you a quick example practically. Uh, on September 11, I lived in the United States and on September 11, you know, what happened on TV? I didn't witness it. I lived in Chicago, not in New York City. But I was in a state of panic. And then I, because I meditated, I thought, okay, what do I do when I have nowhere to go? You go within. That's a yogic saying. So I sat and I started my meditation and it worked just like on any other day. And then all of a sudden my heart opened, my heart, a sense of opening and love and compassion for the people in Iraq. And I thought, why Iraq? Everybody's talking about Afghanistan. Uh, the United States will go, you know, uh, to war with Afghanistan. That's what they're telling on TV. And I thought, well, I don't know. But anyway, two years later, then you know what happened. And then, you know, and then um, after the war in Iraq, then uh, I kind of realized, oh, wow, I had a vision of what was going to happen. Everybody has visions during their meditation. So we're just not be afraid of it and we're not crazy. Please just look deeper. That's it. <laughs> we have that power to know where to go. And so I understood, oh my gosh, they're suffering so much. And so at that point, there was no enemies. Yeah, of course, there are consequences of what people do. But then some people are skeptical. Was it really Iraq? You know, was it really from? From there, I don't want to go, you know, into that because I, I don't know everything. But still, you have a lot of resources and just look into it. You're never alone. You're protected and guided, even in the worst moments. Oh, thank you. That's 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 also this very simple technique. I I test that uh, tonight. That's that's really interesting uh, because it's so. If you put... Yeah, because Sorry. It's, it's 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 so easy. This is a technique my um, uh, spiritual teacher gave us, and uh, because if you put attention on the breath, sometimes there is panic and worry. Am I breathing right? Oh my God, I'm not breathing. Oh, I'm breathing too shallow. All these worries in the mind. We don't want that. But if you put attention on the nostrils and inside the nostrils, that's not happening. And also, the third eye is a is a thing. It, it exists and it works. And uh, just putting attention on this area, uh, your state of mind will change. Your body will be, um, you'll be more in control of your body mind, for sure. If you don't give it that, wow, Eureka. That's perfect. That's, I, I have had a little series. I haven't put in uh, anything for a long time, but I had a little series, mini life hacks. Uh, but this kind of... Uh, of this is really a pill, mini pill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, 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 that's really something uh, you can just test out immediately. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, the nostrils, for some reason, I, the breath doesn't work as well. It's also good for people who have some pre breath breathing issues. Um, yes, right. Like, like asthma or something. And also... There is a yogic secret, but I'm going to go ahead and say it, that the yogis after a while in meditation don't breathe at all. They breathe with their pineal gland. And that's something we, in the West, we haven't looked into, but it, the breath stops sometimes in meditation and you shouldn't panic. Uh, it's just a very natural, because we don't, okay, they don't need oxygen. They've done, there are so many studies, you know, at, Duke University, Yale University, all these universities where these studies don't get very, don't become very public. I don't know why. They're 
people want to talk about other things, but I've been looking into those for 30 years now. And I, I know for sure there's a lot of evidence scientifically. The yogis don't breathe. They only They only breathe if they want to. And so their consciousness is not oxygen based, they say. Do, so you, do, you, more. do you talk about that in your in your book? Uh, you have yes, I talk about. Um, I don't know how deeply I do, but I definitely I mentioned a lot of um, techniques and uh, easy meditations, like quick, quick that yeah. we can do just to change our. Uh, prejudice on a situation or to change our fears of, uh, you know, especially money, right? Everybody wants money, wealthy people yeah. want money, poor people want money, middle class want money, everybody wants money. Um, so the, those fears are the biggest for everybody because it's become the life force, otherwise you don't have food or... A roof <laughs> or over your head, and yeah. Right. So because of that, everybody has the fear. And I believe that that's where we need to look into because that fear is unnecessary. There's so much fullness. If you look in nature, right, there are all these leaves, there's so much abundance. It keeps coming back and back and back despite the, the pollution. <laughs> it's fullness. There's so much abundance and the divine doesn't want us to be poor. My, my guru, my spiritual teacher, Dr. Bhaskaran Pillai, says, God doesn't care if you drive a Rolls Royce or ride a bike. So it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> of you don't want to hurt anybody, right? It should be done ethically and honestly. <laughs> right. But, okay, people who want to know more about that can read your book, right? They can, uh, yes, they can read ahead. my book. And what's, the, what's, for, what's the exact title again? Because I haven't memorized the title. It's called bliss lab because i thought we are bliss we can be in bliss all the time and we should test it yeah. so and then the subtitle the um subhead title <laughs> would be how the ancient yogis acquired supernormal powers and how you came to Yeah, exactly. That's because I'm I'm going to buy that book because that's that's the kind of thing I was interested in in my teens already. I read books about uh, all, all sorts of things. That's totally fascinating. So that's a book uh, one can read. The other book um, that's coming out soon with uh, a lot of inspiring stories of over 20 uh, people who most of whom I th I would assume had some sort of life change because uh, coaches mostly have had that. Um, yes. That book, Evolving on Purpose, uh, Co-Creating with the Divine, is coming out on the 30th of August. Everyone who wants to grab a Kindle ebook uh, at a very low, low launch price can go right on the 30th and uh, buy it. And um, I hope a lot of people do that because that will propel us up in the charts and then more people will find it. Yes, the help us to diffuse this book. Yes, yes, it's a... <laughs> I believe that we have come to a point where we need the spiritual solutions because we're going as far as we can with the political ones and we need good politicians, of course, that we have. But now we also have, you know, spiritual solutions that work very fast. We have to expand that and uh, that's... Uh, Ex expand, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we are not limited. The limitations are in our minds. There are no limits. And everyone who wants to learn more about you, about your work, who wants to work with you, can uh, go to your website. We will pop the link yes. in the description. Oh, thank and, you. Um, so everything is uh, available there. Um, I'll also uh, put thank a link so to your to your book. And uh, once we have the link to our book col collaboration. There's also an Italian version of that. So it's uh, called Il Laboratorio della Felicità. Ah, okay. Um, it's a little different because it was the second edition. And uh, so there's also a new chapter on 2020 onwards, what to ah. do for So the so, more yeah. recent version is the Italian version. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, great. So we have to learn Italian to read and what I, you had to say about 2020. And and students are Italian, and my um, also clients, and they wanted something and and i never had you know that they don't all 
you know, are, they're not fluent in English, yeah. many of them, so I wanted them to. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm currently writing something in German and then I will have that translated into English. So, um, uh, so it's, it's natural yeah. that we are yeah. using our native language also to, uh, to publish things, right? Yes. And well, to uh, people benefit, I believe, you know, with your teachings in uh, Germany, that's wonderful. In any case, I'll check out your Italian book then too, if yeah. there's more in it. It's more beautiful. I have to confess so that my Italian book is more beautiful because, um, first of all, it was translated by geniuses, like amazing editors. I I didn't write it. I, I can say, oh my gosh, my parents were obsessed with languages and, you know, both writers. My stepdad was published by the Academia delle Scienze, Academia del, della Crusca. These are the two top uh, academies in Italy. And they were very particular and they would be so proud because it was just impeccable. And also the content was beautiful. Yeah, I did find some typos nowadays. We're not anymore, you know, like, but definitely um, it's really beautiful and I was very proud of how it came out, but was very happy because it will convey more of the spiritual ideas that in English I don't think it came out as, come across well. as, well. Yeah. Not as well. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. Thank you so Let much. You thank you very much. For I don't want to stop, but thank you so yeah. much. Thank you for, very much for this uh, awesome interview. Um, Oh, yeah, and for, for coming coming on here and talking to us and sharing your story and uh, your view My of pleasure. life and your vision for how to move forward and I hope a lot of people are going to check you out in the with the links in the oh. description. Uh, I had no doubts that I would love this interview because if you you know you wrote a chapter for uh, co-creating with the divine, definitely we are like-minded. But it was beyond my hopes. Thank you so much. I loved your questions and everything. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you.